Hi everyone, my name is Trevor. I work for Community Counseling Solutions as the Burn Community Liaison. Thank you for having me here today. Um, we're going to talk about substance abuse, addiction, how it works in the brain, and uh, behavioral health resource networks, which is what BIRN stands for. I want to know a little bit about my audience today. So who do we have from maybe what part of the hospital? Just a few of you, just so I know who I'm talking to. Anybody? Volunteer? Yes, sir. Okay, cool. A young man in a hat and then us and on that are volunteers. Okay. Kind of everywhere. Okay, awesome. Cool. Well, what a great group to have. Um, so like I said, we're going to talk about substance abuse and fentanyl trends across the nation, addiction in the brain, and how that um, is kind of changing throughout time, the way we address that uh, with care, and then behavioral health resource network programs in Oregon, specifically Umatilla County. So this chart right here shows you the amount of fake pills that have been seized by law enforcement from 2018 through 2021. And you can see that that trend is really kind of an exponential curve. Um, and if, when I move to the next slide, you'll see that that exponential curve continues to trend upward. Um, so that shows you or tells you that it's a crisis across the nation and, and it's a huge issue um, in a lot of ways. Uh, more and more fake pills are being created and introduced into the United States. I'm sure, you know, if you work with people from the emergency room um, or anything like that, you've probably heard many, many stories of that happening right here in Newman Tillett County. Um, and what's happening is, you know, a lot of times people think they're getting one kind of pill, but they're actually getting a pill, a fake pill that's been laced with fentanyl. I wanted some more updated statistics since that last slide only went to 2021. Um, so this is saying that in 2023, the DEA sees more than 79.5 million fentanyl laced fake pills. Um, so if you go back to this in 2021, it was just nine and a half million all the way to 79 and a half million. So it's really bad. There's a lot. Um, laboratory testing indicates that Seven out of every 10 pills seized by DEA contain a lethal dose of fentanyl. So it's, uh, it's an issue. Okay, so what kind of impact does that have on your local community? Um, the influx of fake pills laced with fentanyl has resulted in a public health crisis. And that's kind of what led to, um, you know, the implementation of Measure 110 in the burns in the first place is to address this issue that was on the rise. Um, you can see down here, this is an authentic oxycodone and this is a fake oxycodone. I know the colors are different, but the size and shape are generally the same. And I bet that um, as their manufacturing process of these fake pills continues to evolve, they're probably going to start matching the color too. It's not just oxycodone, it's Xanax, Vicodin, anything that can be pressed into a pill that people like to buy and use to get high. It probably has a, a, a version of it laced with fentanyl. Um, so this creates rising concern. Uh, the prevalence of these counterfeit pills, you know, it compromises the safety and well-being of our communities. And I want to highlight specifically uh, how it's affecting the youth, right? Because there's lots of um, kids who are maybe in their experimental phase. When I say kids, I mean middle school to college age students, right? They're they're in their experimental phase. They may be at a party or out with their friends and they say, hey, try this oxycodone. It's going to feel good. And they, they're like, okay. And they try it and it's laced with fentanyl. And for a first time user of fentanyl, you don't know what the dose is in that pill. You don't know their tolerance level and it can result in a lethal overdose. So it's, it's a pretty scary thing. I'm not trying to fear monger, but this is the reality of the situation. Um, and, and I forgot to mention this in the beginning. At any time, if you want to throw out some comments or questions, feel free to interrupt me or raise your hand, whatever you want to do. I don't care. I'm here to have a discussion with you. So don't be afraid. 
Uh, right here, it shows you a lethal dose of fentanyl versus a lethal dose of heroin. So you can see the requirement is a lot less for fentanyl than it is for heroin, uh, which makes it, again, even more scary. Broke. Yes. What would be the reason for increasing the fentanyl in any of the fields? What would be the reason of the people doing? Yeah, yeah. Um, the short answer is it comes down to profit margin. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head, but if you have an oxycodone, an authentic one, and it costs five dollars to produce, and you sell it for ten dollars. Uh, with fentanyl, you need far less of the drug, and it's very easy to manufacture in mass quantities. So now my cost to produce is two dollars, and I can still sell it for that ten dollar. So my profit margin has increased, you know, per pill. Are you talking strictly street buying that thing, not pharmacy, or both? Um, as far as like the illicit or illegal use yeah. of fentanyl, well, yeah, um, I, I, and the pill making. And so do people, is fentanyl um, given out through the pharmacy yeah. in pill form? Well, lace. Like you said, like the two pills, one was blue, one was yellow. Oh, mm -hmm. So like if somebody's on oxycodone or whatever med they're on and they go to the pharmacy, they're not the ones that are getting. No, yes. Okay. And thank you for that clarification. Yeah, this isn't an issue with, you know, um, from the pharmaceutical companies or anything like that. This is strictly on the street. Uh, people are going to the drug dealers and buying it from them. Yeah. Um, any more questions about that? Yes. So basically, they don't really have quality control. So it's, you might have two more grades of fentanyl that kill a person that day, and the same batch of somebody else might not have got killed, but got high, so get some addiction. Yes, exactly. Right. Yep. Yep. Um, did I answer your question fully earlier? I'm not quite sure, but I that's okay for the moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, if you want to go back to it later, ask, you know, I'm more than happy to do that. And your statistics for pills, not like gummies or all the other stuff that's floating around. Yeah, this is just the stats for pills from the DEA and the NIH and things like that. Yeah. But that's not to say that that kind of stuff isn't out there. I'm sure we're all aware of that. It can be really put into almost anything. So. Okay, so we talked about fentanyl and, you know, how much of it is in the United States. And I'm going to talk about addiction and kind of um, the shifting perspective on how we treat that moving forward from this. Because if we're going to recover from this crisis, we have to figure out how to get people back on the right track, right? Um, and, and I just want to point out that um, the neurological impact neuronal ad adaptations and behavioral manifestations um, are, it's, it's all recognized as a, a brain disorder now. Um, it, it used to be kind of looked upon or frowned upon, stigmatized as uh, a moral failing if somebody was a drug user. Um, and we're really trying to educate people and pull away from that is a brain disorder. And there's a couple reasons why we call it that. Um, and that's basically this topic here. Um, when somebody is addicted to drugs, um, let's just start with an example. You have somebody who, you know, lives a relatively normal life, but maybe they have some issues and a lot of people might have a drink on the weekend to deal with that or whatever. Um, this person decides that they want to try um, some kind of opiate or maybe they had a prescription of opiates before and they want to continue using that. So they try a little bit they feel really good. You know, they can manage their day. They can go about their daily life and they don't feel any of the anxieties or um, stressors that they would normally feel. So they're like, OK, well, I'm going to keep using this. But they develop a tolerance to that, like with any substance. So it requires more of that substance to continue that same uh, feeling. So as time goes on, they up their dose, up their dose, and it gets to the point where when they're not using, they're feeling withdrawal symptoms. So now the only time that they feel good or even okay is when they're using the drug. And that's kind of how that addiction starts and how it becomes such a vicious cycle. Um, when, a lot of times by the time uh, people reach that point, they realize like, I don't want to do this anymore. 
but they have all these other stressors and all these other things that they've avoided in their life that as soon as they stop, not only do they have the withdrawal and they're not feeling good, now they have all the stuff that they've been kind of ignoring, right? And all kind of piles on, so they just continue to use. Um, also, the way that addiction affects the brain, it affects um, your, your dopamine pathways, uh, the way that you get any kind of joy or happiness out of anything. Um, so your prefrontal cortex actually changes and you have an inability to use those critical thinking skills. You have the inability to show up for appointments on time um, because all of that has been affected. And so when we're thinking about care for people who have substance use disorder and we have the you know, strict abstinence-based approach, I'm not saying that they shouldn't stop. What I'm saying is we should give people a little bit of grace moving forward because they have the inability. It's like any other mental disorder, right? We wouldn't take somebody who has depression or anxiety and, and place that on them and say it's it's your fault or you know your your moral standing is is failing because you have this condition. Uh, so I think it's important to kind of start to change gears and view it that way and give people a little bit more empathy in their recovery journey. Um, Any questions about that? Okay. Yes. Is there um, that you know of any difference from how addiction like this impacts a person that's maybe younger versus older, like in regards to memory or those sorts of things? Yeah, I'm sure you've heard that. Um, People always say, how, how have I heard a word before that? People who do drugs at a younger age are kind of stuck in that maturity level for a long time. Um, and I would say that while that's not 100% true, I think that parts of that can be true, right? Because you're so focused on your addiction that they're missing out on all those opportunities for growth. And the way it affects the prefrontal cortex, that uh, uh, ability to make decisions, that's a very like, adult human ability, right? That's something that adults have to be able to do. So if you don't have those skills, you're not gonna develop fully at the same rate as everybody else. Does that answer your question? Where's the, okay, cool. All right. Um, so why do I talk about that? Um, I think it's important to address stigma and educate people on what's actually happening because it's only going to make the community better, right? If people can better understand that, we can approach um, treatment better um, in a more empathetic way. I think that we can have a higher success rate and that's better for the entire community. Um, I worked law enforcement prior to this position, so I've seen both sides of the coin and I'm not saying no consequences. I'm not saying don't arrest people who are doing bad things, but I think that conglomeration of treatments and um, deterrence, I guess I should say, or consequences for those actions would be a very effective approach to address what's going on. I'm not trying to make a political statement. I just, you know, <laughs> from what I've seen, that would be, you know, kind of my opinion. But yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears again a little bit. We talked about fentanyl and crisis, and then we talked about um, addiction in the brain and kind of how that works, pretty basic level. Um, and that leads us to behavioral health resource networks, which is a hot topic. Measure 110 is where we um, get our funding for that. Um, and I know that's um, kind of been on the forefront of the news lately. Um, but hopefully I can help you understand it a little bit better. Um, recently, within the last couple of weeks, they actually revised it again, but it's not final. So I didn't include it in this presentation, but um, it's called a deferral program. And it's kind of what I was just saying. It's there's still the ability to arrest for um, drug use. And now they have the option of either you know, serving jail time or receiving these services that have been built up and established over the last three or four years. So hopefully this will kind of change the dynamic and we can kind of see some better results come out of this. Um, but 
The money comes from cannabis tax revenue. So some of that goes to education. Some of that goes to the state police. And uh, the rest of that goes to BIRMS, which, as I stated earlier, Behavioral Health Resource Networks, uh, formerly known as Recovery Centers. Um, so that developed uh, access to care grants. So the Oregon Health Authority awarded $22.3 million in grant funding to 70 organizations across Oregon. And they've been using that money to build up these entities and these recovery centers to help people who need it. Next slide, please. After Measure 110 came out, they said, OK, we need to define what these recovery centers or these burns are going to look like. And so they passed Senate Bill 755. And it basically is a list of guidelines that says, hey, this is how it needs to be. These are the services you need to offer, et cetera, if you want access to this money. Um, so they're mandated to fulfill those various requirements. And, and some of those are low barrier access to services, uh, free screening, and ensuring that the services are offered in every county and tribal area in the state of Oregon. So Umatilla County has a full burn right now. Now, the way it differs is if you go over to like Clackamas County, right, you have all these different organizations who have been doing this kind of work for a while. So if you have like peer support and housing services, right, in Clackamas County, that might be two different entities. Um, and Grant Yellow Moro Wheeler, CCS has all the grants for all the services. And Umatilla, we have the grants for peer, uh, peer support, uh, sorry, for housing and for um, harm reduction. We have part of the grant, but CCS still offers all of these services just because we know that, hey, there's a need here in this community for that. So um, yeah, next slide, please. And so what are the services that are offered by Burns? Um, Peer support, I mentioned that one. Uh, generally, CCS hires people who have two years or more uh, in active recovery, who have kind of walked in those shoes, right? It makes sense to have somebody who's already made that journey walking side by side with someone as they're trying to also recover from their substance use disorder. Housing assistance, as you know, when somebody's really into the world of drugs and maybe they're on the streets, they don't have someplace to live, it makes it even harder to get out of that um, they can't shower, they don't have a, a kitchen to, to make regular meals, et cetera. So we offer six months of housing assistance with up to uh, three one-month extensions for a total of nine months. And that's just to help them get back on their feet, establish a place to live, and, and kind of like a, a, a headquarters, so to speak. Um, and along with that, we have supported employment. So while we're helping them with their housing, we're also setting them up with a job that they can see themselves making a career out of. If they don't have the skills, we help them develop the skills. If they don't have um, res, you know, if they don't know how to make a resume, we'll help them build a resume. Whatever they need to get and keep a job, we're going to help them do that. And that service can extend for the rest of their life if they want to. Um, so they can always kind of be there to help them navigate that. And then um, the standard treatment programs that have always been offered through um, alcohol and drug counselors or, you know, in-resident treatment programs, things like that. Sorry, inpatient or outpatient, is what I meant to say. Um, and then something else that we offer is uh, medication for opioid use disorder. And that would be, has anybody heard of buprenorphine? Okay. Um, what about Vivitrol? Okay. So Vivitrol would be for somebody who has alcohol use disorder. Um, and it, it basically, um, you know, if they consume alcohol, it doesn't make them feel very good. So it's to help prevent drinking that alcohol. Buprenorphine um, is for opioids and it will reduce the cravings and withdrawal symptoms so that somebody can, you know, maybe make it just far enough out of that withdrawal to where you know, they're feeling pretty good about it. And, and that can be a continued, um, that can be like a prescription that they continue to receive for the rest of their life if they need it. Um, I've heard the argument, oh, they're just trading one drug for another. Okay, fine, say whatever you want. But the thing is, this drug was ruining their life and this drug enables them to be uh, you know, a father or a wife or a mother 
or um, you know just have that normal normalcy in their life. So it's a better alternative, in my opinion. Uh, and there's several other medications that are offered depending on the situation, but those are the two main ones. Um, any questions about the burn programs, the monies, or anything like that? Is there a certain time in a person's recovery journey that they qualify for the program? Great question, and thank you. Um, yeah, uh, at any point in time, somebody could come in, and the services are free. Uh, of course, we'll try to bill insurance first, but um, ultimately, everything is free to the client uh, at the end of the day. Uh, something else, and this is what's kind of the uh, the chokehold right now, is they're required to have a, a SUD diagnosis from somebody who's licensed to give that diagnosis. So getting everybody in, and getting in those diagnoses when there's a shortage of clinicians has been a bit of an issue, but uh, it's something that we're navigating through and doing our best to fix. Yeah, thank you for that. Yes. So even if someone is um, already, I'm not say this, but already in their recovery and they're just needing support to like aim sober or any of, like any of these other things, they could come in like if they're not actively needing treatment at that time. Yeah. If they have um, a diagnosis from at some point. Yep. Yeah. So if they if they have the diagnosis and they're in active recovery, and, you know, say they've been, I, I don't like to use the word clean yeah. anymore, but that's what everybody knows. They've been clean for say six months. Um, yeah, they could still potentially receive these services. They would still have to see a CCS clinician prior, but yes. Cool. Anything else? Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, that's it. Um, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Um, yeah, so like I said, my name is Trevor. Uh, I work for CCS as the community liaison. Um, if you have somebody or you know somebody and they need services, you can call or email that, or you can just call any CCS front office desk and they can um, guide you in the right direction. But I'm always open to answer questions and stuff like that. So, so. all right, cool. Thank you.